Hey Raghunath, tell everyone about our Patreon community. Sure, Kostuba. The Wisdom of the Sages Patreon community is an incredible online yoga resource. If you like the type of yoga wisdom and culture we share on the show, then our Patreon community is a great next step. This is a listener-supported podcast, and any level of sponsorship will unlock a wide range of live and archive classes, talks, and even workshops. Raghunath teaches, I teach, and we have a host of other excellent teachers on topics ranging from yoga philosophy, asana classes, storytelling, Ayurveda, kirtan, cooking, meditation, and a lot more. We even have an incredible online bhakti 12-step recovery group. So if you want to check it out, go to patreon.com slash wisdom of the sages. All right, let's get it on. Live from Calcutta. This is Wisdom of the Sages, a daily yoga podcast with your host, Raghunath, and co host and senior educator of the Bhakti Center in New York, Kostuba Das. Welcome to the show, everybody. Welcome to Calcutta and Kostuba's Live in Mayapur, four hours north of me on the Hoogly, aka the Ganga. But it's uh, no longer called Calcutta, Raghunath. I thought you were. It's called Kolkata. The... Kolkata. 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 Huh. You know, it's like the East India Company just. Built there, built this city on top of three villages. It was also really interesting, Kostuba. You know, it's the Ganga, of course, but it's actually, it's, it's, it's tough to say because if you actually look at a map, the Ganga goes parallel to the river that runs through Mayapur, which we call the Ganga. Here they call it the Hooghly. It's sort well, of it's, a, it's, a it's, trip. It's all the Ganga. It's just all like different. Yeah, branches. it's all coming from the Ganga, but the thicker portion of the Ganga runs parallel. And it ends up in Bengal. But I guess at the end of this Hooghly is what they call Ganga Saga or the end of the Ganga. Because it's all Ganga right now. It's all Ganga. It's all Ganga. This is where I've, you know, I haven't been Mighty in Ganga. Calcutta in so long, Prabhu, since like I was a new devotee. You have to go check out the Uta, Uta Danga setup that, that they have there now. Where Prabhupada met Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. You got to go there. Rana Swami practically ordered me to go there the other day. You should check oh, really? it out. You're in Calcutta. So you're trying to pass that order on to me? Thank you. No, I mean, I'm going to My mom myself. told me to clean my room. Can you clean my room for me? Oh, you're going to be I'm like that. Joking. I'm just joking. <laughs> I'm just doing this out of my love for you. I want you to experience <laughs> what Rana Swami feels is such a valuable experience rather than hog that to myself and then... Oh. Come on the show and say how I did it and you didn't. <laughs> I thought oh, I you have such a good intentions, and I'm always thinking it's evil. It's just like the saxophone thing with Mara, you know. Well, yeah. let me tell you this, my friend. Yeah, let me tell you this. It's good to be here, and there's a lot of things to do. There's even a Lord Chaitanya Museum, but I'm not doing any of those things. You know why? You're I am getting all my ducks in a row for the release of my book. The re. Oh yeah. Vamping my website and my mailing. I'm doing nothing but staying in this room and just working for four days. Okay. And then I'm going on a creative trip to Goa where I'm working on uh, another book. A creative trip. I'm on a creative trip. And then I'm going to go to, we're going to wind this whole thing up in Vrindavan. I'm looking forward to it. Okay, good for you. Yeah. How are you? you I'm good? Doing Everybody's great. getting better. We, we had a lovely um, day today at the Ganga with Karuna and family. Little Karuna, 10 years old. The little, future little awaits Karuna you. Little Karuna took her first Gunga snot. It was cold. And at first she was, you know, struggling to get in there and afraid to dunk under. And, you know, it's because it's, it's cold, you know. And then that's I saw... That's where you need Uncle Ragu to come over and just... No, no, no. That's in. where Uncle Kostuva stepped in. I said, okay, okay. you have to do... it Because then I started to leave and she's like, oh, it's now or never. That's what she said. <laughs> she said, it's now or never. So I said, okay, you want to do it with me? She said, yes. I said, okay, then you got to go with me, though. Okay, you, you promise you will? She said, yes. I said, okay, ready? One, Was two, it deep? Three. No, not very deep. Just deep enough to dunk. Okay. And then, and so then I, then she, then I got out, then she got, then she went back in alone. 
And then I saw the yogi in her because then she went deeper and then she just started to concentrate and she was just standing there alone, looking out at the Ganga. And then she mm -hmm. started to dunk. She went, she, she went in there 10 times. And, and I saw she was just like oh, wow. standing there like in some kind of meditative pose, you know? I said, something's going on with Karuna. She's, she's been in it's this. Like, imagine if that like opens her life. third eye, just wakes her up from previous lives. Yeah. It's anything, anything like that could have been happening as far as I'm concerned. So I was impressed. I could see she's not ordinary. She's, she's like a yogi. She's going into her yogic kind of like thing now, just on her own, you know, as a 10 year old, I was impressed. Well, you know, especially she conquered kids. it. I've watched her conquer her mind and senses. Hmm. I watched her do it. It was pretty cool. Special births being children of devotees, bless you, Mara. Like uh, we had uh, Ashraya, Ashraya Tatva from Australia. In Mayapur, he came on the show, talked about mm -hmm. his kid. He raised his kid as a devotee. The kid, you know, like a kid, they just don't get interested in it. And then um, the kids started listening to the podcast and it sort of woke up what was already in him. There's special births to be taking birth in families. And the mm -hmm. parents think, well, they, well, I'm going to make my kid a devotee. You don't have to do that. You, you can encourage a kid on their spiritual path, but you'd be surprised what's already in that kid of yours. Mm -hmm. It's quite impressive. And sometimes you just need the right person or the right place or the right experience, maybe a dip in the Ganga. And all of a sudden, yeah, Uncle Raghu, little Uncle Raghu pushing you in, dun, 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 <laughs> in your head underwater. <laughs> uh, Krishna. It was nice. It was nice. Then we came back. We had a nice uh, pasta feast at, at Tara's place. <laughs> nice. Well. Um, we got Q&A right. still to take it's care of. It's Q&A day today. Um, people sending questions. We're ready for answers. But first, and uh, a couple announcements, Miss Mara, tell us what's happening. Mara. Yeah, we got some back to your cover group meetings going on today. At 9.30 a.m., there's a beginner's meeting. At 11 a.m. is Japa Sadhu Sangha. And at 12.30 is an ACA meeting, Eastern time. Mm -hmm. And then tomorrow we'll do the show at the same time slot, which is 8 a.m. And we'll do Q&A again. 8 a.m. Eastern time. Yeah. Send in more questions still. You can take them. Yep. Wisdom of the Sages 108 at gmail.com. Yep, yep. All right. All right, Rogan. You want to dive into this, Miss Mara? Yeah. Or Kostuba. Who's got the questions? Well, I got, we got them. them. But I sent them to you as well. We used to do this thing where I get one, you get one. I get one, you get one. I now know. it's like a free for all. We're both going out. What? Yeah, why is that? I don't know. You just, just make a rule and not tell me about it. Well, you just kind of <laughs> went with it. it. Just happened naturally. Like, I'm not going to tell him. <laughs> it took you this long just... to catch on. It, took, it only took you seven Wait months a to second. realize. <laughs> He's changing stuff. What's that telling me? We didn't ever vote it on this. Oh, right. Krishna. Okay, here's one. Hey, Mara. Who's it from? Uh, oh, it's from Mia. Mia was just at our 300-hour uh, really? training. She graduated. She's a great lady. Great Actually, she's on the show right now. Is she? she we love Mia. She's great. Where's Where she from? Oh, she's from Philly. She's from Philly. So, hey, Mara, I have a question for Q&A. The story with Indra in which he gets cursed to become a hog. It's said that the story explains how powerful Maya is. While I can understand that the influence of Maya made him forget his godly manner, isn't him becoming enthralled in his incarnation of being a pig? kind of the point we incarnate to learn certain lessons when i first read this story the first thing that came to mind was one of judgment when we put our own judgments on the pigs we think how grotesque but the pig sees his family and his wife and he sees his, the true nature of love and and life finding pure bliss and ignorance so i guess the question is how does this story demonstrate how maya's illusion get in the way of our spiritual advancement if that illusion is what is needed to find more spiritual advancement from Mia good question um did, did, did that really explain the story do we need to tell the story we definitely need to tell the story well here is King Indra the lord of the lord of all the demigods truthfully except for Brahma he's like second to none 
very, very, very refined being has his own planet. His planet is considered to be, you know, the heaven of heavens. And due to some offense, he got cursed to take birth on Earth as a pig. In India, you see how pigs live. They actually sit in, in uh, what do you call it? Stool. That, so like swamps that people like go to the bathroom not in. Just, not like an ordinary swamp, like sewage, like in the gutter. Sewage. Right? They eat and they eat sewage and they, and, they, and they eat sewage and they love it. And they're covered in it. And sometimes like, Ever have your dog, Mike, when sometimes my dog jumps in the pond and he like, sh what do you, I don't know what that's called when the dogs wa wag themselves out and mm -hmm. they shake, they shake and they get you all, you're like, oh, Gus, don't get me all wet. The pigs will do that in the feces and then shake themselves and you're like, yeah. <laughs> so she's saying, well, what's the big deal? And, and so anyway, Indra, when all the demigods, all the other demigods who Indra was their leader, they were like, Oh, we can't tolerate to see our Lord in this lowly position. So they, they went to visit him on earth and all the great demigods came and said, listen, Indra, you gotta, you gotta apologize for what you've done. You're in this horrible, yeah, lowly I think position. It was Br Brahma came and, and told him your, your term is up. You can come back now. Gotcha. And he was saying, I like it. What's why would I want to get out of here? It's great. Look, I got my beautiful wife. Look at that tail. Huh? And look at her little hooves. And like, look, look at my adorable little piggy kids and look at all this delicious food I have. Why would I ever give up this? So okay. that's the story. Kostuba, you want to uh, poke around with uh, well, Mia's question? Yeah, you know, Mia's question, Um, it seems to be going, I, I'm not sure if I'm keyed in on it just right, but it seems like she's going in two directions with it, if I understand it. Mm. One, she's talking about judgment. In other words, I think what she's saying, and she mentioned well, here he is. He's finding pure bliss and ignorance. So what's wrong with that? If someone finds bliss one way, why do we judge it as right? And if someone finds bliss in another way, why do we judge it as wrong? So w it, it, even though the pig is slopping around in sewage, is it is it being just judgmental to say, oh, that's like, why do we pity that? It seems sure. to me like that, that that's part of a question. Then, But at the end of her question, she she kind of, it seemed to me to go in a bit of a different direction saying that um, she says, I guess the question is how does this story demonstrate how Maya's illusions get in the way of our spiritual advancement? If that illusion is what is needed to find more spiritual advancement. In other words, he was cursed to experience that for a reason. So then that's good, right? Well, it's only good if he gets, if he learns the lesson that right. you're meant <laughs> to learn from it. Right. So, so, uh, well, let, but let me start here. What this story is meant to illustrate is that we, the nature of this world and the nature of how our mind and our senses work is that we become normalized to suffering, however abominable it may be. Mm. We, after some time, whatever our situation is, begins to feel like it's normal and we begin, and, and, and there's a programming that's, you know, a, a mental programming that connects the senses and the objects of the senses that registers how our senses respond to the objects of the senses. Mm. And what happens is we, when I say we become normalized to suffering, it registers just enough comfort or pleasure that we never move out of that slop, <laughs> right? We, we will stay in there, you know, so, so the, so the pig's mind is programmed in such a way where it's saying, this is good. This actually smells good. This, this, and then the pig follows that programming. Now, getting to the second part of her of her question, we we all have free will. You know, that's that's something that we all have, and when we're exposed to the circumstances that are created through the illusory energy, we all have the opportunity to apply that free will, and to learn from that experience, and to grow through that experience, or not to and to just dig deeper into the slop and dig deeper and, you know, and continue to live in the sewage. So it's a graphic story. It's a story that is meant to kind of, um, it's, it, it's meant to kind of, yeah, reach into that disgust that we have, but it's, it's saying that, you see, it's on one hand, what Mia is saying, there's, it makes sense. Like in one sense, our enjoyment, 
material enjoyment, whether it be on the earthly level, on the piggish earthly level, or on the, the heavenly level of Indra, for mm -hmm. the Vaishnava, for the Bhakti Yogi, for the person that's tasted real, the real bliss, not the artificial bliss, the real bliss of the self, of the from what's inside. Someone that's experienced that, they're going to look not just as the pig, they're going to look at Indra and saying, how pitiful, how sad. Right. I wish I could help them understand what their potential is. That the hap because all the happiness of of the material realm is a blend of happiness and, and misery. And so sure. again, whether it's the pig or whether it's the regular earthling or whether it's Indra, the the deep spiritualist looks at that with a, a, a sense of compassion, not judge not judgmentalism, compassion. Right. You, you might see someone suffering, you know, physical pain. It's not judgmental to say, oh, no, they're suffering. That's compassion. So 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 the story is meant to help us understand that <clears throat> we're very prone. We're very prone to become normalized. To to the to to seeing material enjoyment and the suffering that comes with it as desirable when and, and it's sad if we limit ourselves to that it's sad if we don't um with our ears hear about what's beyond it with our minds apply it to what could be beyond it and and put in that effort to to learn from this and to try to to try to go beyond it and that's the compassion that is com it's not judgmentalism it's compassion and uh and, and so that's how i understand this story but i'd like to hear what you have to say Rob. Well, you know, I look, I always tell the story, I'll, I'll oftentimes skip this story and use my own analogy. And okay. yeah, we are, you know, it's not judgment, it, but it's discerning and sizing things up. When I was a teenager and I was, you know, call myself straight edge, I lived on the Lower East Side and it was a time where like heroin addiction was out of control. And you'd see people wearing nice suits and stuff like that, but they were strung out on heroin. And they'd literally be standing up asleep, nodding out. Yeah. nodding out. You've seen it happen. And it's like first thing in the morning, I'm going out for a jog at six, you know, 630 a.m. And someone is right there. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, someone is right there. And so uh, just standing there. So anyway, um, sorry, the phone rang. So anyway, I was like, if you were to offer that person anything healthy a bowl of organic fruit a fruit salad an organic salad brown rice and beans they wouldn't want it why because their taste is so covered by illusion that they think very thing that is dismantling their family their career their life is a good thing they'll just they'll embrace that that's what they'll ask for they don't want anything organic. They don't want something that's going to help them or heal them and get them. But standing outside of it, you could see this is so sad. This person's wait, wasting their life. So when we see a person absorbed in pig life, yeah, we do have compassion because we know it's a suffering condition. And we should be, you know, as humans, we understand that humans can act very, very high. They can be noble. They can be beautiful and courageous. Or they can act really, really low. So human, we have these uh, this opportunity to you know go, go real north or real south. Animals are in a in a position of a fearful condition of eating and sleeping and mating and defending. So if Indra is in this position, it might appear good in the same way it appears that wow, I wouldn't mind being a bird. You know, hear people say that. Wouldn't mind being a bird. Oh yeah, you ever watch birds? They live in fear constantly. They're, they're eating at the bird feeder and they're looking over their shoulder or a deer. You know, it's very it's very rare that most animals, except if you're at the top of the food chain, don't live in some type of horrific fear. And so uh, fearing, mating, sleeping, old age. And when you get to old age, there's no natural death for animals. For the most part, they start to get picked off once they get weak. So, um, Yeah ignorance is not bliss not by a long shot and um and it, it, 
Indra was in a position where he couldn't see, like I'm missing out on something greater. And that's what the story is supposed to illustrate. Like we actually have amazing spiritual potential, but we're settling for a low class, low brow life, low brow lifestyle. Low, it's just everything is low class. And we think, oh, it's pretty good. It's pretty nice because we're like Indra. We're like the pig in stool thinking that the stool is great. And when you get a higher taste, and that's why this, the famous uh, uh, verse from the Bhagavad Gita, as soon as one experiences a higher taste type of pleasure, there was a time in our life where Friday night going out, getting hammered, I was, and you're bragging to your friends, we were so wasted. Now to look back at that, we're like, what are we crazy? What were we thinking? I do not want right. to go there. We like to go to bed early. We like to wake up early. Friday night, 8.30. I'm in bed. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> like to rise early. The nectar is in rising early, not in staying up late. Not in getting obliterated out of your mind with intoxicants and you have hangover the next day. That's like a pig in stool. So that's what that's what Maya does to us. It makes us Maya makes us think the worst things are really cool or really wonderful. But they're generally in Tamas and Rajas. Okay. That's how I take it. Thank you, Ravana. You're welcome. Shall we move Continuing on, to question, on? Number two? question number two is Hello. Who's it from? Will you please e explain Who is it Prabhupada's from? view? Hold it. Hold it, hold it. First of all, you're on the third question. Oops, I skipped that one. Let's go. But I mean, we could go ahead and do this one if you want to now. Let's do that. Now one. We're into it. Okay. But say who it's Will from. Will you please? Ex this is from uh, Aaron Heller. All right, well, Aaron, okay. how are you? Will you please expe explain Prabhupada's view on the tree Morty? Prabhupada's our, our guru's guru. On the tree Morty. So if you're studying. Eighth grade Hinduism, which I did, you know, there's this idea of Trimurti, which is Brahma, Shiva, and Vishnu, and very a very lame way to explain what that is. It's like Father, Son, Holy Ghost. That's how they'd explain it. I remember in eighth grade. Um, you actually studied it in school. Yeah, didn't you study Hinduism at all? No. <laughs> no. Really? No. My I'm kids in fifth grade like... did the Ramayan uh, play. Well, they went to some and, uh, kind of you know, Rudolf school. Steiner school or something. Right? Yeah, but I went to public school. We studied Hinduism. We didn't learn tons of Hinduism, but we learned like, okay, there's Hinduism. They worship various gods and idols. Maybe they have a monkey god, a river god, a mountain god. They kind of moved me yeah, out of school. Yeah, there's a tree morty. What's that? They kind of moved me out of the regular class before we got to that. Yeah, thing. they put you in that... Uh, Put you out in the uh, trailer hut, out in the yard. <laughs> we had a trailer. It wasn't even a hut. It was a trailer. <laughs> okay. Okay. We had those huts for the bad kids. Yeah. Um, but the tree Morty is Brahma, Shiva, and Vishnu. How does Prabhupada explain those, Kastuba? Yeah. What's well, his you know, Prabhupada he doesn't usually use the term tree Morty. He usually uses the term the Guna avatars, right? Sure. And so, so what is Iskan's view on this? Well, it's not just Iskan's view, but this is the view of the Gaudi Vaishnavas, the, the view of the followers of Sri Chaitanya as they understand the writings of Vyas. And um, that is that everything springs. You see, if you if you did see, hear this in a class on Hinduism, they're probably saying, "Oh, well, the Hindus believe that there are three gods: one for creation, one for maintenance, one for destruction." Right. And then you walk away from that thing. Oh, okay. I guess they believe that there's three. They're equally powerful. They're kind. You know, like you know, I've always believed in one. You know, or the way that I was raised, there's one God. They believe that there's three. That you wouldn't be walking away with a clear understanding if you walk away with that. So the way that we we understand the teachings through Srimad Bhagavatam, which we accept as the commentary by Vyas on his his other writings. On, particularly in the Vedanta Sutra, <clears throat> is that behind everything, there's also ultimately one source, one living source, one personal source, one God, one personal God, right? And that's Sri Krishna. And he manifests that one Krishna. He, he's got multifarious energies, right? He, and, he, and he manifests himself in multifarious ways, in all different varieties of ways. There's something called the Purusha avatars, which are three different levels of 
Lord Vishnu that are, you know, that Krishna, that boy Krishna, he's existing beyond the material realm, right? Beyond the bubble of the material world, which has unlimited universes in it, multiverses, right? He's, he's existing perhaps. beyond that. Yeah, he's existing beyond that. And then for the maintenance of the multiverses, right, he manifests three Purusha avatars, three different levels of Lord Vishnu. The One is kind of the soul of the entire material world. Then one is the soul of each universe. And then one goes in and accompanies each individual soul on its, on its sojourn. So those are Purusha avatars. He comes as Leela avatars. He comes for play, usually performing some kind of rescue, you know, whether it's as a fish, whether it's as a tortoise, whether it's as a half man, half lion. Sometimes even that Krishna who's beyond the material realm comes in as an avatar as himself, as Sri mm. Krishna, right? And so he comes in, you know, as Lord Ram, he comes in as Leela avatars. Those are play, they descending for play. Sometimes he comes as Yuga avatar, which means in the, in the four different seasons of, of time as they cycle. Uh, an avatar will come to demonstrate the, um, the, the path of yoga for that, for that yuga, for that time period. So he comes as yuga avatars for that purpose. And the, what, what uh, Aaron is referring to as the tree morti here, we would call that or the guna avatars, that this material realm is composed of three varieties of material energy. Uh, sattva, rajas, and tamas, and that there's an avatar that is presiding over each one of those. Um, Lord, Lord Narayan is presiding over sattva guna, Lord Shiva over um, rajaguna, and I'm sorry, Lord Shiva over tamaguna, and Lord Brahma over rajaguna. So the three phases of time, creation, maintenance, and destruction, you could say are overseen by these three avatars. Um, but it's not that we see them all as equal. We see them all as Krishna's energy. Like if Prabhupada would often quote Shankaracharya, uh, mm -hmm. who I believe was quoting another source, although I'm not sure where it would come from, but Prabhupada always quotes, quotes it as Shankaracharya. He says, Narayana Parovyakta, that before when at the time of the of yakta before before the universe was manifest narayana paro you know narayana is beyond all that he's before all that mm. so first there's narayan vishnu right and then everything that manifests in this material world including the gunas and including the guna avatars those are energies separated energies of lord narayan or lord vishnu so the three guna avatars what again the question was what is iskan's view or what is the gaudiya vaishnava view our view is that the three are all different energies of krishna whether it be narayan who is krishna himself whether it be shiva who is a transformation of narayan uh, a unique transformation of narayan mm. or whether it be brahma who in most cases is an individual soul like you or i with that is especially empowered that to to preside over these three phases of time or to preside over these three um varieties of matter uh he manifests himself or manifests empowers another being to preside over those those energies something like that that's pretty good Right. That's pretty good. All different kind of avatars, right? All different kind Whatever of Whatever you think it's... is in that outer space is out there. <laughs> it's out there. <laughs> it's, it, it's out there. It's, it's quite fantastic. We can't even fathom. We're just going by what clues the sacred literature gives us. But Brahma, Shiva, Vishnu, you know, the Father, <laughs> yeah. Son, the Holy Spirit thing, that's not the answer. That's not the answer. But, that's you know, the, the, the thing is, if, you, if we really want to understand this, we have to understand that the conceptions, the theological conceptions that are coming out of Bhagavatam and out of Vyasa's works, it's nuanced, it's creative, it's, it's, it's wild, it's beautiful, it's sophisticated, it's, um, it, it, it's far out. It, it's not a simplistic thing. Oh, they believe in three gods. It, no, you, you're not digging deep enough. You're not really trying to understand it yeah. if you're going to 
just stick right there. Yeah. All right. Uh, there's one supreme God. Okay. And they all have got their works to do. And they manifest in many okay. different ways. Yeah. You know, I th I think you added the ad answer that complete. I'm gonna let's okay. just go to the next question. Well, you gotta Who go is, back which up. Which is now. from, yeah, which is from anonymous. Anonymous. Oh, well, I, I really like this question because I okay. I'm, I'm I'm with the person. Um, how important is it for us to desire to go back to Godhead, to back to the spiritual world? Is it such as uh, it is such a far out concept to me that I could that I could that I could even go back? Trust me when I say that I'm that even in this one lifetime, I've been many people, and I am not proud of it. When I think of why I have chosen this path, my first thought has never been to go back to the spiritual home. It's more about trying to return a love that has been giving to me unconditionally. But is that really enough? I hear so many devotees talk about going back, and I understand it, but I don't feel it. I don't know. I don't know how things work. I never lived this life before, and I'm definitely an overthinker. Your thoughts and insight on this matter are much appreciated. I'll take you, a step with this. Maybe because explain what what uh they're asking exactly like what is going back to god sure what are we talking? uh Prabhupada, our guru's guru he had this expression going back to godhead which means the soul doesn't go to a higher planet or a lower planet like a hellish planet they go actually out of the material universe altogether they go back to the spiritual realm and have pick up some spiritual relationship with god with krishna and so they're saying, well, it's sort of a lofty concept, you know. It's like a Christian saying, I really want to go to heaven. I really want to go to heaven. I really want to go to heaven. So this person's saying, you know, I find it hard just to deal with that. I find, like, I just got to return love and see God in everybody, perhaps. I'm like I'm like this person as well. I'm never thinking, I want to go back to Godhead. I'm not really thinking about my death. But I practice bhakti for now, for today, because today it feels right. And I like myself as a practitioner of bhakti yoga. I like who I'm becoming. I like that it helps me control my mind, control my senses, control my thoughts, makes me rise to the occasion, become a better person. And in, in by doing that, I'm changing my atmosphere. I'm changing the circle of people in my life, like drastically. I was sitting with you yesterday. You, me, and Tara were reading together. Here, here's me, me, Tara, and Kostuba. We're almost all 60 years old, and we're reading from Lord Chaitanya's pastimes together. And Mara and Catherine A., you know, every night I've been reading to Mara, Catherine A., Moses, and uh, it was nice to have you guys there, too. We're all reading together, and now those guys are listening to all three of us read. But it was so special. Like, in my mind, I was thinking, what a special little club this is right now. What a beautiful group of people this is right now. And... um. Oh, and Mara said that too. It was it was special. And so I was thinking, yeah, we're sort of like on, I feel like I'm on some higher planet. So not just in this, it, this life is special. But the yogis, the great sadhus, the great rishis, the great sages say, actually, what you're preparing in this life is preparing you for your next life. You're preparing your consciousness. And whatever your consciousness is like, you're going to attract people like that if you're really into partying and drinking you'll find people that are into partying and drinking if you're into sports you'll find people that are into sports if you're into high spiritual topics you'll find that in this life and the next life so i'm i'm with you you don't i'm not planning my death and like it's gonna be great when i die i'm planning this life i like what i'm attracting in this life what do you say about that mr k um yeah i'm in, i'm with you i mean um certainly Srila Prabhupada used that phrase quite a bit uh you know go back to godhead but if we really read his books in depth we'll see that he wasn't merely indicating some kind of like escapist kind of yeah. idea uh, you know, another phrase that you can find Srila Prabhupada said a lot, and it's really kind of echoing a phrase uh, 
from Rupa Goswami's Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu was Prabhupada would sometimes say, he would say like this, simply, somehow or other, you become attached to Krishna. Right? Mm. Simply so so uh he's not necessarily saying or or you know, he was also fond of quoting a verse from Padma Purana. Um Smartavya Satatam Vishnur, Vishvartavyo Najatuchit, Sarve Vidi Nasyadasyur, Etiyoreva Kinkara, that um Smartavya Satatam Vishnur, one should remember all the time Lord Vishnu or Lord Krishna. And Vishvartam uh, Vishvartam Vyo Najatuchit, and one should never forget Krishna, right? And that Sarve Vidi Nasetasyur, Eitiyore Vikinkra, that all the other rules and all the other regulations, everything mentioned in the Shastras, everything mentioned in the sacred text, they exist just for the purpose of those other two rules, right? All the other rules are just for these two, that, we, that our mind goes naturally with affection. To Krishna, that's the goal. Going back to Godhead, if if you ultimately if your mind goes there, it doesn't matter whether you're in heaven, hell, beyond this material world, within this material world. These things become insignificant. So um, that's what you know. That is what we practice. We we are um, we are practicing Krishna consciousness. We're not practicing material world escapism. Mm. Um, but but all that being said, you know the idea is that your destination is determined by your consciousness. So if you develop that consciousness, the common result of that would you would be you would enter the loka or the locale, right? The the place wherein Ooh. that consciousness loka fits. and locale. locale. You like that? Is that where it's from? Is that where the word comes from? Loka. I mean, come on, locus it must, right? Yeah. And loka. You Locus. are a wordsmith, my friend. Oh, okay. Right. It just kind of it. flowed from you. <laughs> I was quite <laughs> impressed with that. Okay. So, yeah, but, you know, that is the idea that our, our awareness, you know, the quality of our awareness, the quality of our consciousness determines our destination after death. And so right. if your awareness is centered around Krishna, then you, then, you, then you manifest in a place where everything is centered around Krishna, and that would be back to Godhead. Um, so in one sense that, that, that is kind of the secondary thing, right? The, the, the resultant, um, right. that results from the state of one's consciousness, but it's the state of consciousness. That's the goal. So how is it important for us to desire that desire may be the basis for you developing that consciousness. You know, we are, we do read, you know, Krishna's Leela. We we read about go, go, <laughs> Excuse me, Gokula Vrindavan and Goloka Vrindavan, you know, the places of Krishna's leelas. Um, to, to, you know, to develop a desire that, why am I here? Why am I, you know, Indra in the slop, you know, when I could be living the life that my soul is designed to live, you know, in, mm. in, in a spiritual realm? So I don't think... Um, I could picture a very serious, well situated bhakti yogi with a with a very clear desire to transcend this realm and go beyond it. But yeah. but I'm kind of like you in this too, Raghunath. Right? You know how I really feel. How oh. is I feel like I want I want my inner dormant love for Krishna to arise. And exactly how it arises, that is Krishna's business. Mm. Now, I'm a follower of Sri Chaitanya. I'm a, I'm a product of the mercy of Sri Chaitanya, right? That, there's no question in my mind about that. You know, I, I'm a product of the mercy of the followers of Sri Chaitanya in line with Sri Chaitanya. And I know that Sri Chaitanya came especially to give that special love that that is manifest in the hearts of the residents of Vrindavan. So therefore, I feel it's safe for me to assume that because I'm I'm the mercy of those Vaishnavas that that kind of love will arise in me by Krishna's grace. Um, and so I try to follow as well as I can. I try to feel a certain indebtedness to to my gurus, to Srila Prabhupada, and to the 
Guru Parampara, you know, all the great Vaishnavas going up to Sri Chaitanya. And whatever they, what I, what I ask of them, what I pray for of, from all of them is that that awareness will arise in me. And where it will arise and in what variety it will arise um, and what my seva will be. Mm. In one sense, I don't see that in, I, I, I don't, I don't make a concerted prayer or, you know, I don't have a formulated desire in that if you want me to come back, you know, it takes several more births in this world, you know, to, to try to um, serve. Mm. Then that is, that is their, their decision. And it's my, you know, it would be my blessing to be able to, to serve in that way. Um, I was speaking to, uh, um, Mother Sitala, one of our regular listeners here the other day, you know, and she just said, you know, I'm always thinking in my mind, I'm always thinking about how, we, how we can better serve people to develop their Krishna consciousness, how we can better reach them. And she says, and she said, I guess I'm going to be coming back you know, to do this in more lifetimes, because this is what I'm always thinking about, you know, and um, maybe that's what people like you and I maybe. are meant to do. I, I don't know. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes maybe when I get older, maybe that, when I get older, that will become more of a burning passion for me. Yeah. If that's if that's how Krishna stokes it in my heart. Right. That's how I feel. Got to go back to Godhead. Can't stay in this body any longer. No, no, no. God, and, and, speaking of staying in this body, we have to give yeah. a, a big Hare Krishna out to to Rick Radhi Raman, who left his body while we were in India. OK, that's an interesting give topic. A big Hare Krishna there. prayers out to him. He was a Prabhupada disciple who his name is Rick Jaro. Up at the, yeah, and he was pretty he, big he was in the scholar. Yo, yoga Professor. meditation world. He was a Prabhupada disciple. He well, he, he like was in left. the academic world. Like that's where I really think of him is like in Columbia oh, really? University and all that, right? Like, I don't, I don't know. I didn't really know him at all, but I remember I got this email from uh, Prajumna that said, and Prajumna is one of Prabhupada's intimate. He was the translator of the Bhagavatam. Um Prabhupada's Sanskrit to right? Sanskrit to English editor. Editor of the Bhagavatam. So he sent me this Sanskrit email. Hey editor. my friend Rick is there and I really want you to, you know, get to know him, take care of him. He's not he's doing really poorly right now with his health. And then two minutes later Radhana Swami said, Did you see Radhika Ramana's here? I think you should go talk to him. I was like, okay, I'm taking this to the sign from God. And I had lunch with him, and we talked, and we had a very sweet getting together. And um, he found out he lived not far from me. I said, "Please come to the farm. We'd love to have you." And um, yeah, it was just a, like a sweet exchange. We texted back and forth, and then um, he was really looking around the GEV, and he was saying, "You know, I've been away from the devotees for a while. This is." You know, beautiful. What Radha Swami's created here is so beautiful. I was not expecting this, hmm. and um, and then we just got this message two days ago or three days ago that he had left his body. Well, let's um, let's let's fill this out just a bit. I, sure. I got his bio up here. Okay. So, at age nineteen, disappointed with the world around him and seeking a higher truth, Rick left Harvard University and traveled for seven years throughout Europe and India. And a lot of that was in Vrindavan. As a matter of fact, a lot of that was in the the Radharaman temple in Vrindavan, right? So like Oh really? Yeah. Um this pil so he, he left Harvard, went to Europe and India. This pilgrimage is partially recounted in his first book, In Search of the Sacred. In India he became initiated into the yogic disciplines of meditational arts. And that's really he became a a disciple of Srila Prabhupada, right? Mm. At age twenty six he returned to the West to complete a doctoral program at Columbia University, where he received a PhD in Indian languages and literatures. Rick returned to India on a Fulbright research grant to study with scholars and adepts, work on the ancient Puranic mythical lore, and, and uh, write the text of his doctoral dissertation, which would eventually become Tales for the Dying, an in-depth exploration into the mysteries of union and separation in classical Indian mythology. It, it goes on and on about his academic I wish I academic. knew about this before I talked to him. <laughs> oh, well, I also got that um, yeah. that letter that you got from Prajuna Prabhu. So I also spent 
set aside some time to, to spend with him there at the Eco Village. And, you know, for me, I could understand that he was a disciple of Srila Prabhupada, but, you know, it was clear that he, whatever his faith was, it had expanded in a lot of different directions and, you know, that weren't so orthodox in terms of a follower of Srila Prabhupada or Gaudiya Vaishnava. But he was very respectful and respectful of my own faith. You know, I would imagine, you know, because people come into an institution like this kind, especially back when he did, who knows, mm. you know, what kind of who knows it's crazy times. He had. Well, yeah, what who you who, how you're treated, who who you bump into, what 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 kind of moves you in the different ways you end up moving. But I could sense he had a he had a very special appreciation for Bhakti. And yeah. um and we had some wonderful conversation, very insightful and um we had some nice talks, but I was feeling, you know, he was obviously not healthy. He was there at the Eco Village and Radha Swami was just kind of gave him carte blanche, whatever care he needed. Like he was providing for him all kind of Ayurvedic care. And so in, in what, what I was, um, what I was intuiting and, and I spoke to Radha Swami later about this and, which kind of confirmed my intuition and expanded on it was that uh he's someone that was special to Prabhupada and right at the end of his life when you know when he was physically ailing you know a a, a decide a caring loving disciple Prabhupada invited him and said I don't care if you haven't been in ISKCON all these years and I don't care you're dear to me and you're dear to Prabhupada and come and let us take care of you and and I think he so much appreciated that care but I think what I also got the impression was seeing the eco village itself, seeing like, wow, here, here, here's a simple follow of Prabhupada and, and someone like Radha Swami who trying to capture the essence of what Prabhupada was teaching created this, this amazing, you know, amazing eco village, which teaches and demonstrates bhakti in such an incredible way, in such a way where that an academic like him would also appreciate, especially. Mm. Um, I think it just felt to me like Krishna was reaching into his heart towards in his final days uh, where right. his faith in Srila Prabhupada, his faith in Srila Prabhupada's followers, his faith in Sri Chaitanya, his faith in Bhakti may have been somehow um, enhanced deeply. If, yeah, if it went off track, this zipped it back up. Yeah. And he had some deep appreciation he shared with me. And with you, I think I'm with Radha Swami. Yeah. And it, it was almost like perfect closure, but it still was shocking for me that he died. I wasn't, I thought he was getting so then, better. Yeah. So, so we saw him just a couple of weeks ago and when he left the Eco Village and a, a few days ago, he passed away in South India. Mm. Um, I was, I, you know, I, I think both you and I both feel this way, but um, I was really grateful to receive that letter, letter from Prajumna Prabhu and to have the opportunity to speak with him. And I really enjoyed speaking with him. Um, and I just saw some special soul. You know, I, I spoke with Radha Swami after hearing of his passing away. We spoke for, for a bit. And uh, Radha Swami made this point to me. Um, we really cannot judge people based on the externals. <laughs> right? We, you know, when people think into narrow institutional with with two narrow institutional kind of blinders then yeah. we're not going to really understand who's who and what's what and um that rick Jarrell, he was a special soul you know someone like pradumna prabhu is who's someone that both you and i have so much appreciation for someone incredibly incredibly philosophically adept incredibly learned and in, in, incredibly broad in in learning and at the same time humble gentle mm. you know like that's a rare combination <laughs> and uh, rick jero he and rick they were like um brothers they're like mm. real brothers you know and so i i felt uh i felt fortunate that i got to meet him in in his in his final days special soul special movement so now, special so practice now. yeah all that's special just, just those sudden deaths too can make you really start to be extra reflective. Huh? Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Right, right, right. Now, uh, one last thing is I noticed today that um, in your travels throughout Calcutta, you happen to pass the very special area that where um, years ago you had attended the famous Calcutta Book Fair story. Calcutta Book Fair, which you has know, been a secret. It's, it's been concealed. We've never allowed you to speak on this topic, the Calcutta Book Fair, and your, your, it's all, um, it's all coming out. It's all coming it's all, out. It's all coming out, um, so to speak. Both literally and figuratively. <laughs> if you, if you, Good to be back. But if people, if people want to know the, the Calcutta Bookstore, uh, a book fair story, it's now available, right? Uh, yeah, I didn't, I'm not supposed to announce it yet because I think they oh, released right. the audio book too early. But the audio book of my book, uh, Punk to Monk, is out on Audible or wherever you okay. get audio books. And I got a lot of people writing me. If you do have it, you do listening to it. Thank you. And um, make sure you give it a five star review and give us give me a give me a, a good review. I think it helps. There you go. Um, but yeah. I'm gearing up for the whole promotion for the book in April, which I'm <laughs> planning on this weekend, especially with some reunion performances, my friends. Re oh, yeah, yeah, okay. We're doing some shows. Where are you playing in New York? Uh, I don't know. Brooklyn, somewhere in Brooklyn. <laughs> Everything's in Brooklyn. I have right? Sammy books all this stuff. I don't know. I just go wherever he tells me. But I'm going to real Rhode Island. I hope to see the Rhode Island crew there, Harry Ball. Can you going to Philly. Here? Hope to see the Philly crew. Uh, got a bunch of hardcore people, and then all my cool Zoom friends going to show up at the show. Nice. All right, that's it for today. That's it. That's it. Mara, hit it. Thanks, everybody. Q and A. We're going to do this tomorrow. We're going to show tomorrow. What time tomorrow? Same, Same time. time. Eight a.m. Eastern time. Same time. Eight a.m. Eastern time. Send in questions. Want to bring anybody for the interview or walk it and drop it? You should bring in the Frida Chaitanya just for a walk on to the questions. Frida Chaitanya. Jiva knows him. Jiva knows him. He's the. He's in for a partial interview first. <laughs> anyway, oh, he's, he's intimidated. Why don't we take this stuff off? Why don't we take it off the air? <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know what you're suggesting. Talking to like know. a walk on Wednesday, I but bring them on walk on an interview. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Write a review on Goodreads, Shanty Yannick says, hey, if you haven't ordered my book on Amazon, you can order it on Amazon. You know, they made a special Punk to Monk reissue of the Shelter Record Quest for Certainty. If you're into hardcore, you can go to Revelation and order the bundle where you get the special edition book with a special cover. And you get the special edition Quest for Certainty record, which has the back cover of Punk to Monk on the back of it. It's pretty cool. Go to the Revelation bundle, Revelation Records. Also, Italy, got announced Italy because the thing is going off like crazy now. People are signing up. If you didn't sign up, we're going to Italy this summer for our Wisdom of the Sages trip. We love it. Me, Mara, Costuba, Jiva's there, and we're, we're doing Italy again. Get all the... Maybe Lori Pag and the Chief will be there. All the Italians. Um, and it's a great way to go. It's a great way. It's spiritual vacations with Wisdom of the Sages. That's next up for us. Okay, my brother. All right. That is all. It's a beautiful day, every beautiful day. It's magical. 